Thank you, Admiral, for those, uh, for those kind words. And uh, it is actually uh, me who is uh, we're, we're privileged to, to be here with such an august uh, panel, uh, moderated by a good friend, uh, Sebastian. Uh, two of the three uh, historians who have written a book about the Navy in the post Cold War. Uh, the other ones I'll be kind of up, in, in, up in Norway. Uh, uh, thank you, Admiral, for the introduction and the Naval Historical Foundation for hosting today's event. Uh, the director of NHHC, Director Cox, sends his regards as well. Uh, I'm Pete Haynes, and I'll be providing an overview of the 74 day war between the United Kingdom and, Arg and Ar Argentina which entailed projecting power over extreme distances and achieving local sea control to launch amphibious assaults and strikes on the British territories in the South Atlantic in 1982. Since this is the American perspective of the Falklands naval war, it's important to locate the conflict in terms of where U.S. naval strategy was materially and conceptually at the time. At this point, 40 years ago, Ronald Reagan had been in office for just over a year he had been elected on a platform that included a 600-ship navy as a central plank, which, which was drafted by John Lehman. At this point, 40 years ago, Secretary of the Navy Lehman had already established a close working relationship with the Navy strategists in, in Oppo 6. Uh, guys that we would come, uh, names that would be familiar to you today, uh, Peter Schwartz, for example, and, and Bobby Harris, and, and, and Um uh, the, those strategists had a month prior briefed for the first time what would be known as the maritime strategy of, of the 1980s. So, um, and that strategy was shaped by, you know, Tom Hayward's 1979, The Future of U.S. Sea Power, which itself was shaped by his efforts as Pack Fleet two years earlier. It was also influenced by Second Graham Clayner's 1978, Sea Plan 2000. Finally, you know Jim Holloway's 1975 strategic concepts for the U.S. Navy. The maritime strategy sought to deter war and failing that to project power across the seas in the face of sophisticated anti-access capabilities, a global and offensive sea control strategy. For Navy leaders and strategists back then, the naval war in the South Atlantic, the first large-scale naval battle of the Age, was a real test case. One followed intently as the conflict would no doubt have a bearing on the Navy's offensive mind and maritime strategy and the goal of a 600-ship Navy. In short, the U.S. Navy had a lot riding on the outcome of the conflict, a conflict that had been studied extensively, particularly over the last decade, none more so than by the Chinese. On the 2nd of April, Argentina invaded and occupied the Falklands Island, and on the next day, invaded and occupied South Georgia, just to the east. Three days later, British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher dispatched a naval task force and what would amount to 127 warships and auxiliaries to head to the South Atlantic to retake the territory. Many of those ships were requisition ships like the ill-fated container ship, the Atlantic Bear. Here in the slide, we see HMS Invincible departing Portsmouth, heading from the dark, cold, overcast, and wind-swept seas of the English Channel, to the Falkland Islands in the South Atlantic, a place of near constant gale force winds and steep seas, which the Navy's 1983 Lessons of the Falklands, which Doug Zackham had worked on, all in house fitting. At the center of the task force were the carriers Invincible and Hermes. Hermes was the flagship and the older and larger of the two, with a displacement basically that of a World War II era uh, Essex class carrier. Between the two jump jet carriers, they had 27 Sea King Helos and 42 fighters, 28 Sea Harriers and 14 RAF GR3 Harriers, modified for an air-to-air -air Against them, there were 110 Argentine fighters, any of which were strike fighters, and the remainder were configured for air-to-air. -air. Critically, the British lacked airborne early warning control aircraft. Having decommissioned their last catapult and arresting rear-equipped carrier, the HMS Park Royal three years earlier, along with its fixed-wing AEW aircraft, the uh, a quite beautiful ferry Gannett. The British would pay dearly for not having such capability as we shall see. Fortunately for the Navy, I'm sorry, fortunately for the Royal Navy, uh, it had been conducting a major naval exercise off of Gibraltar. 
uh, whose ships return for a quick refit before starting the 8,000 nautical mile trip to, to the south. This included the ill-fated HMS Sheffield, as we see in the slide here. The lead ship of the Type 42 class got in this this for you, which uh, unfortunately Viet was returning home after a six-month deployment in the, in, in the Indian Ocean via Mombasa uh, when she was ordered to join the task force and head south. Uh, aboard the Dwight D. Eisenhower, then Lieutenant, uh, or Lieutenant J.G. Cox, distinctly remembers the looking out over the, over the waters near the final walk down and seeing HMS Sheffield sailing west or off of Gibraltar. On the left part of the slide, one can see the enormous distances involved, and on the right, the Argentinian bases, which were roughly 500 nautical miles from the Falklands as well as the 200 nautical mile British total exclusion zone, uh, which is set on about 12 April or so. The British task force included eight destroyers, 15 frigates, half of the attack, uh, nuclear attack submarines in the Royal Navy, five, including uh, one diesel submarine, and uh, eight amphibious ships. Of the 23 destroyers and frigates, nine were sunk or heavily damaged. By 2 May, a month later, most of the British task force was in the total exclusion zone, with the British having already taken South Georgia in the days earlier. Here is a closer view of the Falkland Islands, part of the campaign, which kicked off at the landing of British forces at San Carlos uh, up, to, up to the north there on 21 May. They were protected by a screen of British uh, destroyers and frigates operating in the Falkland Sound and would come under unremitting attacks from Argentine aircraft in very confined waters. This is the light cruiser USS Phoenix on 7 December 1941, having survived the attack on Skate. She was decommissioned in 1946 and sold to Argentina. In 1956, she was subsequently named the, AR the ARA General Belgrano. Forty years ago yesterday, the Belgrano uh, we see is, is listing heavily to port, is sinking by the bow, having been hit by two torpedoes fired by the HMS Conqueror, uh, a fast attack uh, SSN at 1600 local. She had been approaching from the south with two Type II British made destroyers armed with exorcists, and the, the uh, Belgrano was just about to cross into the exclusion zone when she was hit by the torpedoes. She went down in less than an hour. The first torpedo blew off the bow, and the second hit after the midships. You can see most of the bow is missing in that picture. Rescuing the 700 survivors at night in the heavy seas was a uh, would really be challenging. Here we see a picture of the HMS Conqueror uh, on her return to Scotland by her Perseo Commander Christopher uh, Rareford Brown, the second from the right. You can see the, uh, the description of the, of the flag there. The way it's not counted for British submarines. The first will aboard, and then the second will aboard to fly uh, to fly that ensign. Uh, if you look to the upper right of the ensign, you'll see uh, it looks to be a boomerang. It's actually a white silver bar uh, denoting the, uh, the sinking of the Belgrano. The loss of the Belgrano and the, and the threat that British SSNs. Um, prompted the Argentine Navy to recall most of its fleet, which included an aircraft carrier and modern frigates that had been approaching the exclusion zone in the north. Apart from the German-made Type 209 diesel submarine that the Argentine Navy had, one of the most feared weapon systems in, the, uh, in their inventory was the Super Antandards. Fortunately for the British, Argentina only had about five flying superintendents and five exorcists. Now, flying at low altitude, two superintendents on 4 May, each launched one exocet anti-ship missile at Sheffield at 25 nautical miles. The first hit starboard side of midships and the second missed. The ship sank three days later. Three weeks later, on 25 May, two exocets from superintendents hit and sank the Atlantic conveyor. Uh, north of that position. So uh, we're looking at a, that's a pretty good strike ratio of having only five exercises. 
no less feared at the end of the day were the Argentine Air Force A-4s, which armed with unguided bombs sank HMS Coventry and Antelope, as, as well as the RFA Sir Galahad, and damaged four more British warships. The Argentine Navy A-4s, in the upper right there, which helped sink HMS Arden, were equally courageous, also pressing attacks at high speeds from below mast level. On the other side were the sea heroes, with the Argentine pilots ended up calling the Black Death due to their dark pain scheme. A fitting name as the sea heroes were 23 and 0 in air to air combat, 13 knots by number 800 squadron here on the HMS uh, Hermes. Armed with only a cannon and short range AIM 9 sight miners, only two sea harriers were shot down while four were lost to accidents. The Harrier was, was a capable aircraft. But it did not lack, but it, but it lacked the, uh, the distance. It was not an F-14 Tomcat, which could fly at 400 nautical miles and, and carry eight to ten types of, of missiles. In the Siri here is with a short, uh, short range uh, armed with uh, or short range uh, weapon systems. Um, essentially, it's, it's the British Navy at that point lacked what we call defensive in depth. But they got a lot of use out of it uh, in the way they operated. The low left is the deck of the Atlantic Conveyor, which had built a platform to launch the Harriers that it took it. On the left is our, uh, our, the, the lightly painted Sea Harriers uh, from I think number 809 squad that were, uh, that were pushed to the next line of Harriers. And on the left are the RAF uh, GR3 Harriers, uh, ground attack aircraft that were configured for the air repair as, uh, as well. Uh, this is the Sheffield on 4 May while on anti-aircraft picket duty south of the main task force, which itself was north and Madlock north and east of, uh, of the Falklands. Um, Sheffield was struck, like I said, on the starboard side of midships by one Exocet launched by one of two Super Intendards that had been working with an Argentine P2 Neptune to track the picket ships. In the preceding weeks, Ar Argentine pilots had practiced attacks against their own ships Two of which were uh, Type 42s, the same class as the, she as the Sheffield, and were thus well versed on radar horizons, detection times, optimum approach profiles, uh, which saw the Superintendent Darts climb to get a, a radar update before, sending, before descending back down to 100 feet, 150 feet before launching. The Sheffield didn't know it was under attack until its crew saw smoke from the missiles. Uh, and even they then had five seconds to maneuver a launch chaff, which, which it failed to do as well. As the first Royal Navy warship to be sunk in action since the Second World War, the loss of the Shef Sheffield was keenly felt in the fleet as well as Great Britain. The fact that a single missile could sink a highly modern ship uh, left the Royal Navy uh, in a stone. The next two slides depict a furious battle in the Falkland Sound, termed Bomb Alley by the British, in the third week of May between British destroyers and frigates covering the landings at San Carlos and low-flying A-4s. The Argentine A-4s would use the surrounding hills to mask their approach before popping over the hills and descending to as low as 60 feet to evade at the aircraft fire and sea dark sands, as well as British sea barriers in what were very confined waters. Fortunately for the British, the A-4's bomb, bomb fuses didn't have enough, didn't, didn't have sufficient time to arm before impact. At least a dozen bombs hit British ships without detonating. Otherwise, they would have lost far more than the four that they lost to bombs. It was only later that the Argentines switched to what we call retarded bombs that slowed the flight of the, uh, the bomb before impact. Uh, on 21 May, HMS Arden is hit by nine bombs and sinks. Two days later, HMS Antelope sinks after an EOD attempted to defuse one of 2,000 pound bombs embedded in its hull. Uh, the bomb unfortunately exploded, uh, killing the EOD crew and sinking the, uh, sinking the ship. You can see the, uh, the top is soon after it was hit, and then the, the left is uh, that's magazine went at night. Uh, unfortunately, the ship was uh, uh, abandoned. Uh, minutes early, earlier, and you can see on the right the remains of an uh, 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 antelope in the sound. 
On 25 May, two days later, Sheffield's sister ship, Kevin Tracy's. That same day, north of the Falkland Islands, the Atlantic conveyor was hit by two exorcists launched from Argentina's superintendent guards, which were intending to hit the two carriers. The Atlantic conveyor subsequently sank three days later, taking with it three of the four Chinook heavy lift helos and five Wessex helos needed to move and supply British troops while assaulting the Falkland Islands. Their loss required rewriting, re rewriting the ground maneuver plan as British troops now had to march on foot across the East Falkland Island to recapture Stanley, the capital of the Falkland Islands. Here you can get a sense of the windswept bare nature of the East Falkland Island uh, as three pair advances across the island to Stanley. Here in the Marauder Marines of 40 Commando raised the British flag, having captured West Falkland. Here, HMS Hermes is returning to Portsmouth in July uh, 1982. You can see the, uh, the size uh, of the ship there. This is a picture from Director Cox of the 1982 Liberation Memorial at Stanley, uh, the capital. You can see the inscription of those lost in battle on the upper right there. Uh, strange as it, as it was, it's not the only memorial to enable battle. Director Cox took this picture of the 1914 Battle of the Falklands Memorial, which is also in Stanley. That memorial commemorates the First World War battle east of the Falklands that saw British squadron of eight warships sink six of the eight German ships commanded by Admiral Graf von Schmidt. And here's our final side that would be the cost of the conflict. You can see the enormous loss uh, in terms of lives and, uh, and, and ships. Thank you very much. That's the uh, that's the overview. Hopefully, we we're able to tee up a lot of uh, a discussion uh, on panel. Uh, next, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, uh, a good friend and extraordinarily sharp uh, maritime thinker, uh, one of Germany's finest maritime thinkers, Dr. Sebastian Lewins, who runs as the inaugural McCain Fulbright Scholar in Residence at the Naval Academy. Previously, he directed the Center for Maritime Strategy and Security at the Institute for Security Policy at Keele University in Germany. Uh, his research interests included the German and U.S. Navy strategy and how NATO allies uh, use sea power. He has, uh, he has author, authored or edited, co-edited several books, including uh, the book for Peter Schwartz, along with her own Randy Papadopoulos, who himself has, uh, was, was uh, awarded a uh, very prestigious award uh, last weekend at the Society for Military History. So, Seb, take it away. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this kind introduction. Um, I remember a friend of mine saying um, that um, when you say about people, they don't, you know, they don't need no introduction. Those are actually the ones that crave the most. So as long as people read my, uh, my introduction, I think, I think I'm fine. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a true pleasure to be here today. Um, and I want to thank the Fulbright Commission, uh, as well as the Naval Historical Foundation, for the opportunity to be here. Um, before we come to this fine panel, um, I need to address the elephant in the room, which is, I'm sorry, I'm not wearing a mar maritime seat uh, tie, as opposed to these three gentlemen. Um, so I, I promise to do better. Um, and the second elephant in the room, perhaps, is, why am I here? Now, I was born in 1982. That doesn't mean much, or maybe a lot, depending on how you look at it. Um, but I, I, I'm drawn back to the year 2012. To the year 2012. It was a very fine conference um, at the, hosted by the Royal Navy uh, on the 30th anniversary of the Falklands War. And a uh, very young PhD candidate by the name of Sebastian Bruins decided to apply and decided to uh, give his first conference paper, his first academic paper. And of course, I had no idea what I got my, myself into. Um, I just started my dissertation at the time. Um, and um, there I was at the conference. Um, it, was, it was the last speaker, on the last day of the last panel. Um, just the night before, Chelsea Football Club had won the uh, soccer the football champion league, Champions League, against Bayern Munich. Um, and I met all these giants, 
including Secretary Lehman, whom I read so much about. And I was very anxious, very nervous, sir. Uh, I gave you your book to sign it, the Command of the Sea. I'm less nervous today to uh, get, get this book signed from you today. Um, and I recall that conference that year, 2012, quite vividly, uh, not only because uh, Admiral uh, Sandy Woodward was also there, but uh, during that conference you, you, you revealed uh, that uh, the amount of U.S. Navy uh, support for the potential loss of the Royal, of the Royal Navy was quite significant. Sure, we'll touch upon this today. Uh, and 2012 was also the year when I interviewed Norman Polmar for my dissertation. And it was also, I checked my notes, the year I got into Dove Zeka Iams email list. Um, now, you know, 10 years ago, or even a few years, you know, five years ago, someone would have told me that I had the pleasure of introducing these three distinguished speakers and gentlemen and experts. I would have uh, uh, raised an eyebrow, an eyebrow or two. Um, but here we are. I'm very thankful for everyone who's involved. Um, that we are here. Um, those who need no introduction create the most. I will not read the, your bios because you're all three uh, the, the experts in your own right um, and, and uh, very experienced and so we'll uh, get right into the 50 minute each um, that we've been uh, negotiating uh, over, uh, over these past, past days. Um, I will give you a five minute warning waving this program. If you see me frantically waving, you're over 20 minutes, okay? Um, and then you need to stop. Uh, so, without further ado, we'll go in the order of the program. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction and uh, afraid you weren't going to give us any introduction at all, but you really hurt. It's a pleasure to be back here in this, uh, in this uh, uh, center of our naval history, uh, a history that has taught us that uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes all the time. And we're having a rhyming situation today with the Falklands, one that uh, uh, most uh, militaries, and particularly those uh, in uh, China and uh, uh, other superpowers are following very closely. Let me tell you the, the first inkling I got uh, after we all saw uh, uh, Mrs. Thatcher announce that uh, uh, the invasion would not stand. I got a call from Ace Lyons, who was the NATO strike fleet commander. And you have to understand there's a lot of loose talk uh, always about uh, uh, the special relationship between the UK and the US. Uh, articles come out virtually every other week saying there never was a special relationship, or the special relationship is dead, or there are attempts to revive the special relationship. Those people don't know what they're talking about. There has, between the U.S. Navy and the Royal Navy, a special, a very special relationship uh, for uh, uh, almost 200 years now. And it's real. It's not something that is a vague concept. At the time that the Falklands War started, uh, we had uh, uh, 50 U.S. Navy uh, exchange personnel at Northwood at the uh, Royal Navy headquarters. There were 150 Royal Navy people down in uh, Norfolk at the various commands, uh, Strike Fleet and uh, Sackland, and, uh, and it, it, there was interaction all the time. Uh, there was a, a standard procedure well in place for exchanging spare parts, intelligence, uh, uh, and uh, weapon systems. And Ace called me and he said, you're not going to believe this, but uh, in the last several days we have gotten normal requests through normal channels uh, from the Royal Navy for 100 A9Ls uh, uh, 
for two uh, uh, T2 tankers full of fuel to go to Ascension Island, for two communication satellites, and oh yes, a spare aircraft carrier. And uh, uh, he said, well, uh, what do you think we ought to do about it? And I said, well, let me talk uh, to Cap, and we're going to need to get some advice from the president before we uh, meet all these requests. So, uh, Cap and I agreed that the best thing to do would be to treat these through the special relationship, the existing channels that had been in use since the beginning of uh, lend lease in 1940. And, uh, uh, and that uh, what has been asked for, uh, we can do the T2 taggers, we can do the sidewinders, we can do probably at least one satellite, maybe the two. But, uh, I don't know, giving them an aircraft carrier may, may be stretching the uh, special relationship. So, uh, we better talk to the President. So, Cap went over to the White House, explained this all to President Reagan. And before I tell you what he said, you have to understand the other dimension. There is another agency uh, in the U.S. government and uh, the Pentagon and the U.S. Navy. It's called the State Department. And the State Department was at battle stations, to mix a metaphor, uh, to try to negotiate a ceasefire. Because what people didn't know, most people outside the uh, intelligence community and the White House, was that the Argentines were uh, running the contra camps against the Cuban and, uh, uh, and uh, Russian intrusion into Central America. Uh, and uh, the U.S. was paying for it, but the Argentines had taken on a lot of risk and were very effectively training a contra uh, uh, opposition to the takeover, the communist takeover in Nicaragua. And Al Haig, who was very pro-UK, uh, but also pro-Argentine for the, what they were doing to fight communism and, and the Soviet intrusion and spreading the wars of national liberation, was desperately trying to find a way uh, to having to blatantly take sides and to uh, uh, undermine the Argentine government in the great work they were doing uh, blocking. So this was a, a major dilemma. Uh, uh, Realpolitik versus uh, morality in, uh, uh, in international relations. Uh, uh, the President and uh, the Secretary of Defense and I myself were not admirers of the way uh, some of the Argentine junta were throwing the centers out of helicopters and uh, doing uh, very uh, nasty things, but uh, it was a true dilemma in policy. And so Cap went over and presented what the requests were, and of course the president knew very well what the uh, what the Argentines were doing. And the president really, really thought deep about it. And then, after Cap had presented everything and sat there uh, waiting to see what uh, he, had, he really couldn't predict what the president was going to say. Uh, he said, give Maggie everything she wants. And that uh, established the policy from then on. He was also telling Al Haig to continue to work hard to try to uh, negotiate a diplomatic way out of this, at least for a ceasefire. But as a result, Cap came back and handed execution uh, over to the Tsar here, and uh, work, working with Ace Lions uh, uh, down in, uh, in Norfolk. And, uh, and so uh, we gave them, uh, we flew right away within days, 
100 A9Ls because the Brits did not have any A9Ls. The A9Ls was a sidewinder that was effective head on. The uh, older sidewinders had to get around behind the, the attacking aircraft to, to uh, follow the, the exhaust. So it was quite a breakthrough. The T2 tankers were not a problem, at least for at our level. <laughs> and it was a problem for the uh, military sea lift command, but uh, they got the uh, T2s down to Ascension Island, where if they didn't arrive in time, the, the Royal Navy fleet could not go beyond Ascension Island. They didn't have enough gas. And, uh, the two uh, satellites were moved within days so that they could communicate directly with the, uh, uh, with the, the Royal Navy fleet from uh, Northwood. And uh, uh, they, uh, uh, when, shortly after the war, I was out in the UK and uh, I had lunch with Sandy Woodward, the commander, and he said, I ought not, I'm certainly not going to pay for this lunch. You were a major problem for me. All those satellites you moved. Every time I went into the comm center, I was waiting for two or three feet of printout paper because there were no uh, CRTs and, and, and no uh, uh, communications other than paper communications there. He said, every bureaucrat from Margaret Thatcher to, to my wife's friend was sending me orders and counter orders and this order. So uh, I just had to shut them down. <laughs> so uh, uh, that uh, we continued to, to provide uh, uh, the, the uh, support, further shipments of sidewinders, more fuel, and, uh, and intelligence, especially intelligence. So there were a lot of special intelligence in turned over, but uh, the far here we'll be able better to address those, uh, those specifics. What are the lessons for today? What are the rhymes that we ought to listen to about what's going on? First and foremost, alliances. You, you, know, you cannot confront tyranny and uh, aggression without close friends and allies. And NATO, of course, uh, at the time, was not able to get involved. The, the uh, Anglosphere did get involved through, through really the special relationship. There were no negotiations about it, except give Maggie whatever she wants. And uh, that was effectively the way we were able to get material flowing right away because it did not really go out of Navy channels. That Navy to Navy all the way. The State Department, uh, I'm not sure anyone at the State Department knew what was going on until uh, further along. I also know for sure that uh, nobody in the Defense Ministry really knew what was going on. Uh, at first, because uh, 40 years ago this week, I was at a formal dinner given for me that had been postponed and postponed uh, by the Defense Ministry at St. James's Palace. And uh, uh, Minister not the Defense Minister boycotted, and uh, uh, Sir Frank Cooper was the uh, permanent undersecretary. And I was sitting across from him at this uh, black tie dinner, and uh, and he uh, he got up uh, to uh, uh, toast the queen, and uh, instead of toasting the queen, he had, as we all had, been uh, with some drink taken, and he gave a toast that I couldn't believe my ears was to the effect that we, we only have one real ally in this fight, and that's France. <laughs> uh, and then he went on uh, developing this topic. And I was somewhat with drink taken as well, and better, had a full wine glass. 
and I literally came within 30, three seconds of throwing it in his face. Because after all we were doing and all the stuff that was flowing, what could this idiot be thinking? And how dare he do that? And here we were in St. James's Palace. Well, the fact is, I found out later, and should have known at the time, that the royal baby was telling the ministry nothing. <laughs> and good for them, as it turned out, because nothing was leaking at the time. And uh, uh, it's a couple of. <laughs> Uh, Admiral of Royal Lady Admiral friends came, came over to me after the dinner and said, You should have told them that classified stuff. That ministry not clear for this. <laughs> and so uh, that uh, saved us both a bit of embarrassment. But uh, it, it, it was uh, uh, a battle that tested a lot of the policies that we and the Royal Navy had been pursued. Uh, politically, it was very bitter. I happened to be a student in England at the big debate over the future of carriers when the Wilson government canceled the, the uh, next uh, conventional carrier. And uh, nonsensical arguments that were used against uh, conventional uh, catapult rest of the year were, were cartoonish. And, and they paid uh, their price for it. Similarly, the, you know, well, the U.S. Navy had at the time, and uh, uh, it was building out the necessary weapons to make it effective. The concept of going anywhere near harm's way around the Soviet Union without a seven-layer defense, beginning with the Phoenix missile, the F-14 uh, long-range interceptor, the Sea Sparrow the uh, SeaWiz close-in defenses, the, uh, uh, the Slick 32 jammers, uh, and uh, jamming aircraft and anti-radiation missile aircraft and so forth. Uh, the Royal Navy had, had almost none of this. They had two out of the, uh, two out of the seven layers. And today, we, we need to remember that uh, uh, we today do not have those seven layers anymore. No more F-14s. The F-18s can't do that job. No, no more Phoenix missiles. Uh, and uh, uh, we do have rolling air freight missiles and with Sea Whiz and its successor. But uh, the book is coming. Sorry. Uh, so uh, the fact is, we, the Royal Navy and the U.S. Navy, have been up against far, far better uh, uh, attack anti-ship missiles than the eggs you sent. Uh, they were called kamikazes. Uh, we survived 1,700 kamikaze attacks in just the 100 days of the Okinawa battle. And the Philippines were uh, another uh, similar size. We had many ships hit. We had many carriers hit. Only one was really put out of action, uh, the Franklin, the new 27 Charlie, the latest model. But the Brits had, had uh, done the right thing with their carriers and had uh, armored decks. We had wooden decks. So when a kamikaze hit, uh, we learned the hard way that uh, uh, we got to go follow the Brits uh, on uh, uh, armoring the decks. And, and our current carriers have triple armor decks, HY-100 steel, but much tough. But more important than that is compartmentalization. The current, uh, well, the Nimitz class has a thousand watertight, a thousand plus watertight compartments that can be closed manually or automatically, segment depending on where the damage is. You've all seen the films of John McCain crawling out of his cockpit and crawling out over the flames uh, on his uh, air refueling boom, dropping down and running over through the flames to pick up the hose to light the fire, which he did for another two hours. That Farstall could have resumed flight operations the next day. 
had, had a lot of dents in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, the armored deck, but it could have launched and recovered. How effectively is another, another issue. Uh, we learned a lot, of, uh, a lot from the uh, lessons learned study that we ordered the, the uh, Secretary of the Navy's uh, OPA staff to do, and again, the czar here was uh, uh, very much a part of that, and uh, Norman as well, and others that are here. And we found that we had forgotten lessons that the Royal Navy had uh, kept. We had outfitted all of our sailors uh, in, in polyester, which fuses, they don't even have to wait to burn, it will fuse to a flash, fuse to the skin. And uh, uh, Ritz had suffered, as we had, by uh, ill-advised reformers uh, in various parts of the bureaucracy, and gone to the lowest bidder on commercial-style mattresses, and uh, for mica tabletops, and things that were poisonous, truly poisonous, when they burned. And uh, uh, so there were these were lessons that we had learned in World War II, both navies, and, uh, and we had forgotten and the Brits had remembered. And, and I, it's not my role here, I don't want to steal the thunder of the lessons learned or uh, analysis wheel really here. <laughs> but uh, uh, we have applied a lot of the lessons, a lot are caught up in the vast bureaucracy and need to be reapplied. Uh, compartmentalization being one. Musk had hardly any compartmentalization, hardly any firefighting. Almost no trained sailors in damage uh, control or firefighting. And their whole fleet is, is played with that, as is the Chinese fleet, who have copied the Russians and grown out the rib of the Russian Navy, and that is a huge vulnerability. They have lots of vulnerabilities. And what we've seen the Ukrainians do to the best of the Russian army, we can count on similar deficits on the Chinese side, but we have our own weaknesses and lessons that we have forgotten. And uh, that has to be addressed. Something like this 40th anniversary, must be used as a time to remember, to go back and look and rethink at these lessons that, uh, that, that uh, have, have to be relearned. So now we'll hear the real truth from our, my fellow panelists. Thank you. I'm not going to stand up because the step over one of these guys. Um, John really shouldn't call me a czar because he's a guy in Moscow who thinks he is. Um, but I do want to tell you a story about, before I get into the full story, uh, about what kind of a secretary of the Navy this guy was. One time I was uh, at a meeting uh, in the uh, cabinet room, I was president. I was sitting against the wall. I was quite junior then. I wasn't in charge of millions of dollars as I was 20 years later. And I get this note from the Deputy National Security Advisor, Bud McFarland. And he says, I hear that um, people in the program analysis shop are trying to kill the 600 ship and 15 carrier Navy. Well, I write him a note back and I said, I happen to be in charge of this thing called the defense guidance. It's not going to happen. Don't worry. Well, that didn't necessarily reassure Bud. And next thing I see, and Bud's on the other side of the room against the wall. He comes over to Judge Clark, who's the National Security Advisor, who whispers something to the president. Now, the person speaking at the time is Gene Kirkpatrick. And if any of you recall, nobody ever interrupts Gene Kirkpatrick except the President of the United States, who looks up and he says, I hear there are people who have a problem with the 15 ship, 16, 15 carrier, 600 ship Navy. Now I support it, who disagrees with me? That is the power of John Lane. Um, 
let me give you first a run up to how I got involved in this thing. In 1981, the year before the war, the British government, Mrs. Thatcher, decided she really wanted to do away with the Royal Navy pretty much. And they were going to kill the Hermes, they were going to kill the Invincible, they were going to close Chatham, the uh, shipyard. And um, I wound up leading an American delegation, talking to our British cousins, uh, with all sorts of ways of looking at how we could postpone this indefinitely. And we kept on talking until the war started, and nothing had happened, thank God. Well, the invasion was, I think, on a Thursday or a Friday. I come into work, uh, my boss at the time was a man named Richard Pearl, on Monday. Uh, and I said, what are we doing about the fall? Because after all, I've been working with the Royal Navy and the, the Ministry for a year. He said, why do you care? I said, well, I just told you why. He said, look, he wasn't interested. He said, go ahead, deal with it. Well, his boss was Freddie Clay, who later became my immediate boss, um, who actually sympathized with the Argentines. And Fred's boss was Frank Carlucci, Deputy Secretary, who sympathized with the Argentines. Well, there was only one guy between me and the president who sympathized with the Brits, and that was Cap Weinberg, who didn't know me from Adam at the time. Well, I started go making trips to London to meet with uh, Peter Blaker, who was the Minister, minister of State for Defense, to sort of start organizing what John Lehman just described. And because I was so junior, with two facts involved. One was, Haig had no idea that this was going on, which Weinberg was very happy about. The other was, the embassy didn't know. And so I never got an embassy car, I was too junior anyway, so I'd take taxis from Heathrow. And I was going out there every week, and these taxi drivers are giving me hell because you bloody Yanks aren't helping us out. And we fought alongside you in World War II. And I have to take all this stuff, knowing full well why I was out there. Well, eventually, the president, as you heard, uh, made his decision and went public. And Cap Weinberger wanted to have a daily, literally a daily list of everything the Brits wanted, how I was going to get it to them, and when I was going to get it. So I was doing this, it would go through a play, he really didn't look at it at all, he just signed off because he didn't want to touch it. And this would go to Weinberger, and if anything was delayed by a day, I would hear about it. Well, at one point, and this really shows you what the special relationship uh, is like, the British attaché comes into my office. His name was Burgoyne. We beat the crap out of him in 1770, of his ancestors in 1777. Just remember that guy's back there. And uh, he comes in to see me, and he says, uh, you know, we don't have money. And I said, I know you. You always say that. He said, no, we really don't. We don't want to order things and then not use them. I said, okay, uh, we both have warehouses on Ascension Island because we actually share why do we care and care for them. Why don't you tell me what you think you need? I'll get it shipped down there and I will only charge you for what you take out. We thought that was a great idea. <laughs> but then I find out that Weinberger called John Nunn, his friend, the Minister of Defense, and asked him if he thought it was a good idea. And I was really annoyed. He said, you it was a good idea, and I thought it was a great idea. You wouldn't have to pay for anything you didn't use. So I went to see uh, the Secretary's uh, military assistant at the time, Carl Smith, who proceeded co with Powell. And I said, I want you to tell the Secretary, he may be an Anglophile, but I got relatives there. Weinberger never questioned me again. I got to know him real well. Um, there were other cases of the special relationship. I remember one time we had a meeting and uh, a Navy 06, our Navy 06, was descended from, I think it was Captain Byron, who actually claimed the fault. So, you know, we had a piece of this going back many years. Um, the Pentagon, and here I think, uh, is something that we might see again right now. The Pentagon became an action office for the UK. I mean, everything else was pretty much dropped. I remember one time a four-star admiral, and I didn't have an office in the Erie, like I would 20 years later, I was in a dumpy room. This four-star comes in, and he figures he's going to blow me away because he starts complaining that I'm 
demanding stuff that he doesn't want to give up stuff. And you may have read that the military right now is going to make them give up stuff they don't want to give up. So I said to him, listen, uh, you know, don't give me a hard time, just give it to Jack Weinberg. That was the end of his complaint. And so we were, we were literally forking stuff out. Uh, in fact, at the very end, there was a request for a system that I think is still classified. Um, and we, I had to deliver it in 24 hours down to Ascension Island from our warehouses in the state. And we did. Um, the reason I say it's relevant today because the President's $33 million request to help Ukraine, that might happen again. I mean, when you're talking that kind of commitment and that kind of money, then you know people are going to drop other things. By the way, running uh, over to the UK, Hague had no idea that I was doing this before the president made his decision probably. The only person in the State Department who knew was Larry Eaton, who was the Assistant Secretary for Europe at the time, and didn't feel like he had to tell his boss. So he didn't. And Hague had no idea that as soon as the, you know, the president said go, things would just flow because it had all been laid out thanks to this guy to the left of me and the Secretary of Defense. Um, one other thing though, it didn't uh, it didn't really end with the end of the war. The Brits had needed to put aircraft down in the Falklands to make sure the Argentines didn't have any ideas of trying again. Uh, and as you know, they're maybe complaining today. Um, so they needed aircraft. Um, and I found a whole bunch of F-4s at Davis Monthly, the, the Boneyard, as it's called. And they were willing to sell the, the Brits F-4, I guess it was the A's, ancient F-4s, J's they were, for 900000 apiece. You know, which is less than you spend on a house in D.C. today. And um, so I went to the Brits and I said, listen, you know, we'll sell you these aircraft, we'll sell you a squadron. And then you upgrade it with whatever you want to upgrade it with. Well, they thought it was a great idea. And that's how they got F-4s down. They called them F-1S's in Sierra. And that's how they got them down uh, to the Falkland Islands. Um, I think uh, as a final thought so that uh, Sebastian doesn't have to wait this five minutes thing at me. Um, John's absolutely right about allies. And the fact of the matter is we have two classes of allies. You just can't help it. Uh, the French, by the way, um, were the French and the, the, Argentine, the Argentines, the Chileans were helping us, or you, the Brits. Um, and, you know, I remember when I was undersecretary and you know, we didn't exactly get a lot of support from the French and the Germans when we went into Iraq. Now, whether we were right or wrong is immaterial. We didn't get support from them. Uh, on the other hand, Britain's always stood us beside us. So have the Australians, by the way. Ever since World War II, they fought and died alongside us. And that's not necessarily something that a lot of Americans, or even American lawmakers, really fully realize. And I think one major takeaway from this war and how we work together is that uh, people on the Hill, people who make the laws, as well as the people who vote, should recognize uh, that not only is it a matter of needing allies, but it's a matter of having them when you need them. I'll stop there. Well, I'm the outsider here. I've never been in the Department of Defense or position. I've never been in the Navy. As a young kid about this high, I think we're an Army uniform. But that's another interesting discussion we'll have some evening. So I'm the outsider, so you get a different perspective. As the Falklands War evolved, Department of Defense and the Navy, of which I'm of course, established a Falklands steering group and a Falklands study group figure out what were the lessons of the Falklands War for the United States. <clears throat> of the 25 members of these two groups, every one was in the Department of Defense, uniform for like dumb civilian. I was the one outsider. Thank you, John, for putting me on the committee. Who was the appendix? Who was the appendix? Thanks, Blessing.
thank you, John. I appreciate that, sir. Why don't you get us some more wine while you're in there? Anyway, so thank you, John, for putting me on. Secondly, he went to Mel Paisley, who was the principal uh, assistant secretary for research and engineering, told Mel, apparently, to give me an office in the Pentagon for a few weeks, and I wrote something called Lessons of the Formulas. Uh, Dubzak and a couple of other people contributed a few comments. I, I was the writer of that, and brilliant, brilliant. Brilliant as a paper. Okay, I've been asked to speak now. What were the lessons of the formulas? Uh, reviewing this, talking to a few people who were there uh, in the last few weeks, I've come up with eight lessons from the formulas. First, they occurred in a location that no one expected. The British were taken by total surprise that someone invaded what the Argentines called Malvinas. Who would, who would invade the Falklands? There are a bunch of sheep herders there, there's an airfield, uh, not much else. So lesson one is surprise. People go where you don't expect them to do things that you don't like. We're here at a naval facility. Navies are a good way of keeping tabs on people and things without having to land troops, without having to shoot guns. So my first lesson, or my first summary I probably, is surprise occurs. And in general, navies are useful when there's a surprise. First surprise, geography. Second is weapons. The British knew the Argentines had air-launched anti-ship missiles. They did not know they had modified a couple of them to be launched from trailers, and they actually hit one of the British destroyers in that. As we look at weapons today, I'm taken with the thought of hypersonic weapons. China has been testing them. The US has started to develop them. I'm told Russia has started to develop. As far as I know today, there is no defense against a hypersonic missile unless you catch it very early or from a launch platform, aircraft or ship. But second is surprise in weapons. Third lesson was lack of airborne early warning. Lack of a radar up there which could detect enemy aircraft and missiles. The British had given up conventional carrier operations and they had no airport early warning capability. Subsequent to the war, they developed it for helicopters so they could put it on their non-conventional aircraft carriers. But what happens today if the United States gets involved quickly somewhere in the world where we can't use carrier-based airborne early warning or land-based airborne early warning, which we have a significant amount of. So airborne early warning or a radar up high, other than a satellite, could be needed to defeat a surprise in different parts of the world where we cannot have an air base or we cannot have a carrier. Next, non-nuclear submarines harass the British were a major problem. The United States thinks only in terms of nuclear submarines. And in my opinion, our defense against non-nuclear submarines, especially against what are called AIP, Air Independent Propulsion Submarines, is definitely lacking. AIP submarines are quieter than nuclear submarines which makes them more difficult to detect. My next point is nuclear-propelled submarines. They are vital for a variety of operations, for patrol, for killing enemy ships, chain land attack missiles, and for anti-submarine warfare. Periodically, people talk about cutting back on nuclear submarines because they've reached a point, have a 
Is there a medical fight in the audience? Of over three bu bu billion bu per nuclear submarine. This is for what we call an attack submarine, not a missile submarine. We've got to build more efficient non-ballistic missile, but more efficient nuclear submarines. Next, there will be surface ship launch losses. The Russians discovered that last week. The Argentines discovered it in the Falklands. We've discovered it in World War II and in Korea, small ships in Korea. But we have to reevaluate how and why and where we use surface ships. Too many people have anti ship missiles. Air launch, or as the Israelis found out, as the British found out in the Falklands, land launch anti ship missiles. Next, and I hate to quote John Lehman in front of him, alliances are vital. We can do a lot ourselves, even with the current reduction we're facing in defense spending. We are still probably the most powerful military country in the world. But is it enough? We need alliances, even with small countries, even with countries that have minimal military capabilities, because we can use their bases, we can use their intelligence, we can use their, we used to call the army, knowledge of the land. Things that we don't have because we haven't specialized in that part of the world. My eighth and last point is there will be surprise in any future con conflicts. I believe there are several steps we can take to minimize that surprise. Ironically, the three foreign countries I've consulted to, the leadership of China, Israel, and Australia, Surprise came up in our discussions every time. What do you, Mr. Palmar, believe can surprise us or will surprise us if we get into a conflict with so-and-so? I think there are ways of mitigating, not avoiding, but mitigating surprise. And happy to discuss that, either classified or unclassified with you afterwards. But the Falklands, 40 years ago, when the three of us were young kids, Falklands 40 years ago taught us many lessons that I believe are still valid. Alliances, surprise, nuclear submarines, non-nuclear submarines, we will lose surface ships, weapons will be launched against us that we do not expect, Airborne early warning or radar above the, our naval forces is vital. And we need good people. That's my comments for this evening. Thank you very much for these three wonderful presentations and thank you for staying within the uh, German-led uh, time frame. Thank you.